You get it? I think so. Although my presentation just disappeared, so I'm just gonna. Do you see me? Or do you see my computer? There we go. Okay. Are we up? I can never see anything from my end. I don't know what you've got. Um, it hasn't popped up on my screen yet. Oh, there it goes. It just took. Okay. Yep, I see your screen. Okay, excellent. All right, um, so like Sheila said, my name is Erin Sheldon. I put my email right here on the cover slide, and I think Sheila will send the slides out to anyone who wants them afterwards. Um, so if you've got any questions, um, also feel free to just shoot me an email, or I think the most common thing that happens is somebody says, I saw this app in your presentation, and I so badly wanted to do it, and I now I can't figure out what to do with it. And I'll, uh, at the end, I'll give you some more examples of ways you can get that kind of follow-up help um, implementing some of these ideas. So uh, this will be a repeat, just the first few slides for anyone who has seen some of the previous ones. But um, most of our students with Angel and Syndrome, most of our, our children and our loved ones, um, are emerging as, reading, as readers and writers, which just means that they don't yet have conventional reading and writing skills. Um, emergent literacy is that time period from the time you're born until you're really school age and are receiving instruction um, to become a conventional reader and writer. We're able to use the alphabet to write messages, use the alphabet to read. And most of our kids are still in that, that um, in-between stage of where we're, they're really learning what the point of print is and how we use it to express ourselves. But the most important thing to know is that emergent literacy understandings, what people understand about literacy before they start school, is directly, directly linked to their opportunities and their experiences. Um, all of the things that we do at home, all the things we do in preschool that lay the foundation to become literate. And we know there's extensive research on this, that students with disabilities like those of Angelman um, have the fewest opportunities and experiences that lead to literacy. So if literacy is something that you have to experience experience all of these things, do all of these things before you're ready for conventional instruction. Um, our kids with disabilities already start out behind because they simply haven't had some of those experiences. And I think as you see these slides, um, you'll recognize what these experiences will look like. And what's really essential is, I think the most common thing I hear from our families is, my child's not ready yet for reading and writing. I mean, she doesn't even use a communication system. Um, and what's so essential to understand is that learning to listen and learning to speak, learning to read and learning to write, they all develop together simultaneously. From the time we are born, we are learning the skills to listen to everyone talking around us and to make sense of it in a way that we can then try to imitate it and express it ourselves in our own communication. Um, we're seeing all the symbolic ways that people communicate, whether it's by writing things down, whether it's with pictures, whether it's by speaking, and we're learning how to understand that and how to try to express it ourselves. So no person with Angelman syndrome is too anything, too low functioning, too young, too anything, um, to be really experiencing some of these, uh, these emergent literacy experiences. And I think that the research that really helped me make sense of this um, is Chris Cleaver's research where he talks about the currents of emergent literacy. So when you are learning the earliest part of literacy um, skills, those first understandings that are emergent literacy, the first thing you're really learning is how to make sense of the stories of others, that other people have an experience, they're expressing their story, we're learning how to make sense of it. And we're learning how to find meaning in our own experience and share it with others. We're learning how to communicate our thoughts with some kind of symbol, whether it's the symbol of speech, whether it's the symbol of a communication system on an iPad or a pod book, um, whether it's the symbols of the alphabet. And I think what Chris would say is one of the most important things is that we're learning that that's a joyful, fun experience, that being engaged with printed language and speech and communication is something we simply want to do and we're really motivated by to do it. Um, emergent literacy, the, the behaviors, the, the understandings of emergent literacy develop from opportunity and experience, 
and from access. And I think that this is a huge part of the puzzle that we're always trying to figure out as families. Um, and I'll give you a lot of examples as we go through what reading and writing look like um, and how they might need to be adapted to our kids so that our kids can access them. But what you'll hear me keep coming back to is that we have to create the opportunities so that our children can have the experiences accessing the tools to really be engaged in reading, writing, and communicating. In this webinar, I'm hoping to um, help all of us as parents problem solve the barriers that our kids face to having those kind of natural emergent literacy experiences in our homes and just gain new ideas about how we can engage our family members in these kind of fun, home-based literacy activities. And I thought it made particular sense to do this webinar at the start of summer um, to give us some ideas of things we can do over summer while our kids are home. Dr. Karen Erickson would be the first to tell you literacy or reading is not spinach. So nothing we do with our kids for emergent literacy should feel like we are force feeding them spinach. If any of this stuff feels like that, we need to do something else. Um, and what I'm always saying is it needs to be like chocolate. We've got to figure out what our kids' chocolate is. Um, how the, the chocolate is what is it they want to read because they can't resist it? What is it they would want to be part of writing because they can't resist it? Because it's just so naturally engaging and so naturally motivating that they just want to be part of it. Um, so we're looking for chocolate. So let's talk about reading. Um, this will be reviewed for anyone who saw the first webinar, but um, what we know about our kids with age when this is an informal survey I did with SurveyMonkey, you can see here that 427 families answered this question, um, and 85% of them reported that their family member um, explores books. They hold them, they look at them, they chew them, so they know that books exist. Two-thirds of our kids rip the pages, half of our kids enjoy the books and seek them out, um, and that's really important. So those are, these are really important emergent understandings. This means that if half of our kids enjoy books and seek them out, the other half haven't discovered them yet. And we're trying to figure out how to make books so interesting that our family member really discovers them. If they're ripping pages, that's engagement, that's good. Um, but we have to figure out how to make our books sturdy enough um, that our kids can experience uh, exploring books without self-sabotaging the way that they so often do. I think it's the impulsivity. It just makes it so hard to resist the fun of ripping pages sometimes. Uh, Two-thirds of our kids turn the book pages but kind of flip back and forth so they haven't really learned that understanding that the book starts at the beginning and we go from front to back, so that's an emergent understanding they're working on. Uh, a third of our kids are holding the book right side up so they recognize which way it's supposed to be. That's an important um, emergent understanding. They're, you know, 40% independently studying the book pages, turning the pages, uh, recognizing the books by its cover, that kind of stuff. And only about three of our kids, three percent of our kids are reading written text independently, which is actually phenomenal, right? This is typical of students with significant disabilities and this is how how our kids with Angelman are. I find it interesting, if you look down at the bottom, it says Explorers Magazines, 42% of our kids explore magazine. There's so many sensory properties to magazines. They're so shiny. They're so irresistible to touch. They're so visually stimulating that um, we should just think about what are the qualities about things like magazines um, that might be getting their attention. 65% um, of our kids enjoy listening to stories. 94% enjoy when we sing songs. And songs is a really important way. Music is a really important way. Singing is a really important way that um, we really become aware of words and syllables and the sounds of language. So that's just really important that so many of our kids are um, interested in music. Um, about a third of our kids are requesting specific stories or songs. Now to me this is really important because we know that typically developing toddlers, preschoolers, ask for the same book hundreds of times, um, I'm sure to their parents' uh, great frustration at many points, wanting to hear the same book again, again, and again. We also know from the research that students with significant disabilities who do not speak 
um, are unable to request for books to be read as many times as their typical peers. But it's that repeated reading, that reading over and over and over again, that allows kids to actually memorize a book, predict a book, that allows them to start thinking of themselves as readers. Kids have to believe that they're readers before they can become readers. And so that kind of repetition is just really important. So figuring out how our kids can have the communication tools to be able to request specific stories and songs is really essential. They need to have communication systems um, or signs or we need to be attuned enough to how they're communicating with us to know when they're requesting that story again because that repetition is absolutely typical and essential. Um, our families felt that 20% of our kids know that the words on the page of the book are significant. 15% that say that their kids attend to the words and not just the pictures. Uh, point to the words on the page and only 5% point to the words as I read the page. This is very typical of students who don't speak um, and we accidentally reinforce it because there are so many ways in which we say to our kids who don't speak, here use pictures. Pictures are what carry meaning. Pictures are how you get things done. Point to pictures so that something can happen. And we accidentally um, actually teach our family members not to pay attention so much to words. You know, we often have, maybe they have a PEX card, they have PEX cards, PEX symbols, and the words are so small they can't even see them. We're telling them to point to pictures. So we have to teach our kids, we have to undo that and teach our kids to pay attention to the words on the page. Um, and I think one of the things that's most important, second from the bottom, says um, families say that 15% of their kids do not attend when we read stories. That is my kid. Um, so my daughter Maggie is almost 11 and um, has never been one to attend when we read stories. I was, I couldn't figure out what I was supposed to do about this um, and trying to solve that puzzle of why she did not attend to stories and trying to get her engaged in books is actually what led to my, my whole um, master's program and much of what you're going to see from here. So it's not like I have one of those kids who was just one of those amazing ones who loved books. Um, Maggie's been a big puzzle for this. Uh, so 73% of our kids are aware that someone is reading to them, two-thirds of them enjoy being read to. Again, here we have 24% of families say my child does not attend when I read stories. So we're going to talk a lot about um, how to get our kids really attending. 42% though say that our child listens to an electronic story being read aloud on a computer or an iPad. And um, that's just a really important piece for us to know because we find a lot of our kids um, who may not attend to traditional storytelling where it's an adult and the child's on your lap actually might pay attention when it's um, a digital system, whether it's a computer or an iPad that kind of thing. And the last thing I'm going to say about this one is if you'll notice that as we scroll down, only 3% of our kids pretend to read to another person or a toy. 6% pretend to read the story. That is so important. That means only about 6% of our kids have the understanding that they are readers. That's what little kids learn. When, when, a, when a child pretends to read to you, even though they don't know the words, even though they can't actually read them, maybe they've memorized the book, maybe they're making it up just based on the pictures, what that tells us is that they believe that they are a reader, and that's what gives them the belief and the motivation and the engagement to do the hard work that results in learning how to read. So doing whatever we can to support our kids to become, to pretend to read is actually incredibly important. Um, so that's just one of the things we really have to be thinking about. We know that typically developing kids take over the reading process all on their own. You know, by the time they're two, three, four, they're taking the book away from you, they're insisting on reading back. But our kids are so often being put in a passive position where they're not allowed, I mean they really just don't have the space to take ownership of the book because they don't have the fine motor skills to turn the page and they don't have the verbal language to be able to try to read the book back to you. So we have to figure out how we're going to support them, how we're going to give them that access to the opportunity to pretend to read to another person or toy. Which is why for so many of our kids, having access to electronic books that are being read out loud is one way that we can support them to, um, to, to see what it feels like to have that experience of being a reader to someone else. 
So I already talked about this, I'm bringing it up again. We are figuring out how we're going to build those opportunities, support those opportunities and experiences um, by giving our kids access to those opportunities and experiences of everything we just talked about, of really believing that they are free leaders. What we know is there are a lot of barriers around access. Our kids' disabilities themselves um, create barriers to them being able to explore books and read. And probably one of the most, the, the most significant is their fine motor skills. We know from the natural history study and other research that their fine motor skills tend to lag behind behind all of their other motor skills and likely um, lag behind their cognition. So many of our kids don't have the muscle tone, the motor control to be able to sit in an upright position, in an organized position, hold a book, and turn pages. So that's an access issue. They're not going to be able to explore books, or maybe they don't, even, they don't have the motor skills to get to where the books are. Right? So we have, they have these access barriers. They can't access the experiences of exploring books and reading books um, because of their motor skills. They have, uh, our kids have huge challenges around visual attention looking. So many of our kids um, really struggle to organize their visual attention um, to really direct what they're looking at and concentrate it on it and at the same time uh, really direct where, what they're listening to and coordinate that with what they're looking at. So we'll talk about that a bit, we'll talk about um, their sensory needs while they're reading, and we'll talk about what engagement looks like. So first, for our kids, uh, in terms of motor limitations, one of the easiest things we can do is try to adapt books. We can take commercial books, like um, cardboard books like those you see here, and we can adapt them to make them easier. So if the biggest barrier that a child is facing to being able to pick up a book is they just don't have the fine motor skills. To pick up a book, hold it steady, reach over, do that little pinch of grip, turn the page, then one of the easiest things we can do is things like hot glue. You'll see that um, in this top picture, um, that's probably just hot glued bits of sponge or foam to each um, page. You'll see down below in, in that uh, Good Night Moon book, um, those look like those little felt pads that you put on the bottom of furniture. Um, you'll see in that Dirty Duds book, um, I'm not quite sure how they've made those page fluffers, but all those are is adaptations to help kids um, with the fine motor part of reading so that we're, we, they can access the book from a motor standpoint. Um, obviously, from a gross motor standpoint, we have to make sure the books are where they can reach them in the first place. Um, our kids, most of our kids tend to really need heavy duty books like cardboard books. And part of that might be that they actually just get more sensory information from heavy books, right? A lot of our kids really benefit from heavy things that give them lots of inputs about what it is they're holding and where it is in space. And so big heavy books might make sense. On the other hand, kids like mine um, tend to, Maggie seems to suggest small things that she can bring very close to her face. Um, and have kind of a small visual field and something small to bring to her face. So she needs books that she can access kind of on a smaller level. And so for so many of our kids, that um, something that really helps them is digital books. All of the iPad apps that have books, um, all the different ways that we can bring books to, to their computer screens and to their iPads. Visual adaptations. Um, the more I learn about cortical visual impairment, the more I believe that most of our kids have it. Cortical visual impairment is when, because of other neurological dysfunctions in your body, your brain is not able to organize the information it receives from your eyes. And so your eyes may be, might be fine, you might have you know, some low acuity, you might need glasses, you might have strabismus, but beyond that, you struggle to receive information from what you see. And we might really need to approach our kids as having a much more visual impairment than is obvious. Um, and feel free to email me if you want more information on that. I'm not aware of a single study that looks at cortical vision impairment in students with Angelman, but it's overdue. Um, and that's where one of the first barriers that can come up is we often laminate things to keep them safe around our kids, right? So that if it goes in the mouth, if it gets drool on it, something spills on it, it's going to be sturdy enough to survive it. But that same laminate might be creating a glare that anyone with visual impairment is going to have a very difficult time seeing what's under the lamination. So
So one of our first things to think about is if you're laminating things to make it accessible to your child, if they're not looking at it, then we need to see what happens if we take the lamination away. And there is paper we can order, I and mean, I use a brand called Revlar, but there's, if you just Google waterproof, rip-proof paper, there's papers we can order um, to print on directly so that they don't need to be laminated. So keep that in mind. Uh, we need to be thinking about things like contrast and clutter. So many kids' books are actually very, very busy. They're, they're, they're visually cluttered. There's a whole bunch of things a child has to be looking at all in one picture, and that's going to make it much harder for them to differentiate between what's the picture and what's the text. The text is just not going to jump out at them, and we need to... Um, therefore make that book more accessible. Um, so many of our kids demonstrate real difficulty both looking at something and listening about it at the same time. And so they often don't appear to be paying attention. Um, I don't know how many times people have said to Maggie, 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 stop, I need to look here, I need you to listen, so I need you to look. She can't do both at the same time. And you'll see that with so many of our kids where they often rely on their peripheral vision to actually look. Their peripheral vision might be much better than the vision directly in front of them. And so they're looking at something out of the corner of their eye, and everyone's so busy waiting for them to look the way we expect them to look, to look that we're not even talking to them uh, the way that we should be. So just know that if a child is not both looking and listening to a book at the same time, don't assume that they're not looking and listening. Um, they may not be doing it um, in an obvious way, or they may not be able to do both at the same time. And so something that's often very important is to pause while they're looking at the book. Don't talk to them. Wait until they've stopped attending to the page, then turn the page and start reading the next page, something like that. Um, many of our kids demonstrate a big need to touch things. They just need tactile input for, for everything. They're just constantly, their hands are out there gathering as much information about the world as they can. That is a classic symptom of students with visual impairment. So if your kids are really grabby and have to touch anything they look at, just think of that as a symptom of a, of a visual impairment and we need to think about how we're going to make that book visually more accessible to them. I'll give you some examples. So this is just a screenshot of a really common, um, of, a, of a kid's storybook app. Um, but just notice that this doesn't look all that visually cluttered to us, but the print is so small that it's actually kind of difficult. The print has really been set up that way for the adults to pay attention to. But if you're a child and if you're someone with visual impairment, that print may just be some black squiggly lines up there, and what you're seeing instead are some, you know, more or less, some high contrast, some low contrast um, abstract shapes below of these dinosaurs playing. I wouldn't consider this the most accessible book. So if our kids aren't paying attention to these kind of books when we have them in front of them, it may be a vision issue that we need to be addressing. Um, here's a, you know, this is a beautifully organized uh, children's library, but if I was a child with visual impairment, this whole thing might actually be visually overpowering, even though the library is clearly well organized, there's this really nice dark blue background to the whole thing, that kind of stuff. Our kids may not be able to look at a field like this, a visual field like this, full of so many books, and actually be able to select one out of them. So we might need to bring them books one at a time and let them see a cover one at a time that most of our kids can probably not process the information well of looking at books um, by their spines. They'll probably need to look at each cover one at a time and not have to look at a row of books on a shelf. Um, here's a classic children's book. Um, you'll see this is so crisp and clean. There's very little visual clutter. This is the the story, the giving tree. Um, the only way that I might adapt this for Maggie is actually making the font bigger so there's even fewer words per page, but this is a classic example of a book with very little visual clutter that's going to be very accessible to kids with visual issues. Um, and we've done a lot of um, Maggie's books, we just make our own because this just turned out to be um, the easiest for her. We tend to do um, a single photo, a single line of text, um, and just make it very short. So this is her AND book for learning the sight word AND. You can see there's this little glow around the word AND. I'm not going to show the video. Um, but um, we then, so this is just a book made on an iPad. Um, she has a hard copy version, but she also actually has a video version on her iPad where she watches it. 
Let me just stop for the first bit so you can see how it works. So you can just see that these are all, um, let me go back. These are all just um, pictures of things that are personally important to Maggie, which is getting at the whole issue around engagement. The text is very large, and we're highlighting it with a laser pointer to really draw her attention to what we're saying. Look at the words. Um, and we have few words per page to make it as clean as possible. Um, um, something that Maggie's sister has been doing um, is taking, making more of these little videos where if she feels that Maggie's paying attention to something she's been reading or that I've been reading out loud, she rereads it to her. This is an app on the iPad called Explain Everything that lets you take any picture and turn it into a video. And I'll just give you a quick example. So. So you can just see that for so many of our kids who might struggle with um, all the other parts of reading a book, if we provide a book to them in a video format like this, where they've got something like the visual stimulus of that laser pointer showing them where to look, um, and where they can stop it, rewind it, and move forward at their own speed, and not have to be completely in real time with our speech, um, it can make a book a lot more accessible. Oops. All right. Um, there's a whole bunch of ways that we can try to adapt things to our kids' hearing. Um, digital books are often great. We know that many kids with autism um, or anywhere on the autism spectrum actually find it easier to comprehend uh, text-to-speech than spoken language. And that might be true of, of a certain proportion of our kids if they don't appear to understand speech as obviously as we might expect. Um, I think that's the case with Maggie. I think she's got um, central auditory processing challenges that make it really difficult to hear speech. And sometimes it seems like she pays, she really it comprehends speech when it's text-to-speech because a text-to-speech is that whole, you know, that computerized digital version of speaking where it's a recorded voice that always talks exactly the same way every time. Um, and there's just such an advantage to that for our kids who are struggling to comprehend. So if you've got a kid, a family member, who, um, who doesn't appear to understand speech, think about that and try experimenting with different ways of using text-to-speech to see if always using the same computer voice um, is helpful. And one reason I like the app Pictello is it has very high quality text-to-speech and it's the same text-to-speech voices, those same computer voices, as the communication apps, uh, Pro La Quo, Touch Chat, Go Talk Now, that sort of thing. So a child can have the exact same text-to-speech in their communication system that they then hear their books in. Um, video books, recorded books, and just making sure that we pause and pause again. So if you've got a kid who doesn't appear to listen to books, try these strategies. Um, and I'll give you some more ideas about how to do these strategies. Um, but try these strategies and see if that appears to make them more accessible um, for your child in terms of how they listen. And finally, sensory adaptations. So many of the times we seem to expect kids to be able to just sit at a desk and listen to a story being read. But our kids have so many sensory integration needs that I think it's most of our kids can, are probably not going to be very successful that way. Cuddling while reading um, gives you all of that kind of weight and pressure from the person next to you, so some of our kids might really prefer that. Um, some might need to hold something in their hands or have something they can fidget with with their feet so that some part of their body is moving. Uh, some of our kids concentrate the best when they're chewing on something and they have all that pressure coming in through their jaw to organize their nervous systems. Um, some kids really like pressure so Maggie seems to prefer listening to stories when she's in um, a big wooden box we have that has some old memory foam at the bottom. And so she's in um, just a small enclosed space. And if you've got a kid who seems to seek out sitting in laundry baskets or storage tubs or ottomans, that kind of thing, chances are they're one of those kids who might attend best to stories if they're allowed to kind of be in that um, snug, almost pressurized kind of environment, right? Um, some of our kids, on the other hand, might do best when if they're swinging or laying on their stomach on the ground or um, on a platform swing, there's you know you can be um, 
you know, propped up on your elbows on a platform swing while also getting a bit of, of movement. Some of our kids really need to be moving um, in order to concentrate. Um, and some of our kids need to be hanging, hanging upside down, have their head hanging, that kind of stuff. So think about that. It might be that they don't appear to be attending to books because we haven't set up a sensory environment that really allows them to be available. Um, and then I think to me what's been really the most important is really thinking about engagement. Um, for so many of our kids, if they have more limited um, experience of the world, more limited language, um, then so many children's books might just not be appealing to them, and that's fine and that's typical. And what we might think about instead is how do we bring them the stories of other people for them to make sense of the people they know, how do we bring them their own story in order to get them really engaged in books. So apps like Pictella make it very easy to write personal experience stories about visiting grand house, going to the zoo, that kind of stuff. Um, there's an app I'm going to show you that makes it really easy to add your child to whatever story they might be reading. But we should think about how to bring them real familiar people, real familiar concrete activities in story form and see if they attend to that. Um, so often it makes a difference who the voice is that's reading to them or who the voice is on the recording. I've seen so many of our kids who don't really seem to attend to storybooks on the iPad where it's some professional narrator, but have it be a classmate, have it be a sibling, have it be mom or grandma or grandpa or dad, um, and it's their recorded voice, all of a sudden um, our child is so much more interested and there are just a great number of apps on the iPad. The iPad is just amazing technology for this. It just makes it so easy to make simple books where familiar people have recorded the book. Why is it moving? There we go. Um, and often, so many of our kids really want to touch what they're looking at. So um, there's some great older kid, totally uh, respectful of older kid, uh, touch and feel books. DK books tend to be this book that you can see down in the, the, the green one. Um, they tend to have really crisp images against a white background with high contrast, not too much clutter. Um, their touch and feel books do not feel babyish. Um, the Maurice Pledger touch and feel adventure books, like he's got the rainforest and a whole bunch of other habitats. They're really, really engaging books. So these are more abstract topics about things like animals, rainforest creatures, that sort of stuff, but they have that tactile element that so many of our kids find appealing. Um, and a lot of our kids might be most drawn to the environmental print that they see. So if they've got favorite foods, favorite cereals, that kind of stuff, you can literally, you can see in this example down on the bottom, all that is is a book made out of flattened cereal boxes that's been three-hole punched and tied together, right? So we're drawing our kids' attention to the print around the things they most know and care about. And there's something real tactile about that too, right, because it's their own cereal. Just going on here. There we go. Um, and for most of our kids, we're going to most likely find that we need to make our own reading materials. Um, this is a gorgeous example of a um, remnant book. Um, so this is Riley's remnant book. So what her mom has done is organized photos um, of the different things that Riley has done with text. And what a remnant book is, it means that we're taking real life tangible um, remnants of our experiences and we're including that in the book. So when you think about it, you can see on the pink page, on the dentist page, one of the things that probably any kid most remembers about visiting the dentist is the gloves, the latex gloves, especially if they had a glove in their mouth, right? So she's put the glove in the page with an image of a tooth. Um, I'm just going to throw out here, there's a really good example of glare though, right? So if we have kids with visual impairment, just be aware of that. If Think about it, if you were seeing this page in black and white, um, so if you had maybe some visual impairment that was causing you to have trouble with all these colors, you can see how that glare might make it really disruptive. 
Um, here's just another page of Riley's permanent book. So her actual movie tickets along with figures at the movie she saw, photos of herself at the event, um, the science event, along with the actual tickets. So this is a remnant book. Um, highly engaging for so many of our kids, both to be able to read about their own experiences. Um, you can, so we're drawing attention to the text down below with that nice white text box, um, but also something for them to be able to carry around. When we remember that emergent literacy is learning to make sense of your own story, share it with other people, make sense of their stories, what remnants do? remnant books do is let us take our experiences, share them with others, and make sense of their stories back. And they really create an opportunity for our kids to walk around with these books, show people what they're doing, and hear other people's stories. I mean, how many other kids probably also saw Monsters at University or had also been to that science event and could therefore um, relate back to Riley about this book? Um, here in Ontario, I don't know if these are widely available, but just at our local dollar store, you can get these presentation folders, which are so easy to turn into remnant books. They're basically like a collection of uh, pocket protectors, but they're practically rip proof. I mean, they're actually really sturdy, and I've got a major product tester when it comes to durability. I mean, she can destroy anything. Um, we have to put really sturdy tape over the top, but um, these have been um, a really effective way for organizing remnant books. And here's um, a local Ontario girl. Here's her remnant book. What I particularly like about Sadie's remnant book is her mom actually took a screenshot of Sadie's communication page, her, the home page of her communication system, her local to go, took a screenshot of it and attached it to her remnant book so that she can carry her remnant book around, talk to other people about it, and have her words, her main words, right there available um, as she's sharing her experiences and making sense of their experiences. So I just think that's a gorgeous example. Uh, and this is what um, that home page looks like there, her mom. You can see she just taped it up so that this page, um, this is the screenshot of the home page of her communication system. It can fold right up into the book when the book is being carried around, and then it folds down as a flap so that she always has her work. Uh, here's just a beautiful example of um, writing personal experience stories or topic stories with our kids. So you can see this little boy has his pod book in front of him. He's selecting pictures, cutting them out, coloring on them. And these are books that he is taking apart in writing so that he will also be highly engaged in reading them. Um, I mentioned Pictello before, um, great app, I know it's expensive, um, it's completely worth it uh, just for the text-to-speech options alone. You can also put video on every page and for so many of our kids, we have a lot of kids who are major video kids, they're video watchers, they can attend to video in a way that they can't attend to static images, video really holds them. And so the, you know, you can have a Pictello story of going to the zoo, and on each page, as you talk about the zebra, or you talk about the rhino, everything else you saw, um, to actually have video of that animal on the page at the same time. So they, um, they have their words and their video together. Really nice, clean interface. You can see that there's not a lot of visual clutter. Every page just has the words above. Um, and the picture, you can play it electronically, you can just put it in slideshow mode where it'll just play, or you can have it read as the child touches the words, um, touches the pages. Um, this is a really great example, I don't know if any of you have children who are highly motivated by foods, um, but what Ethan's mom did is make him a book about, I like to eat food. So what she's done here is made a simple adapted book for him, it's also an alphabet book. Right? So she's drawing attention to letters in order to help teach him letter names and sounds. A, A, I like to eat apples. Um, she's teaching him the alphabet along with all of the foods that he cares the most about. Right? Um, beautiful example of using Pictello of how to do that. I tend to make most of Maggie's books, I don't know why, this is just how I do it, um, in the app Keynote on my iPad, and it's so simple. If you go to this website, you can see on this screen, or if you just Google um, CLDS, it's the Center for Literacy and Disability Studies, and they have PowerPoint book templates. What you're looking at right here is a screenshot of 
what their PowerPoint book templates look like. You can just download any of those onto your desktop computer, onto your iPad. Um, it's very simple to download them and right there just start filling in the page. So if you want to write an alphabet book, you've got an ABC book. You can choose whether you want to have the, the sign language um, sign for that letter on each page, which is awesome for many of our kids or not. Um, but you can take a look at your different options and it's just so simple. I mean, I, I know a number of families who aren't big on all the techie stuff. So they just go in, print out the template and then glue things over. That works too. Whatever works for you, I'm a digital person. Um, what's really nice is those same PowerPoint book templates that I just showed you um, open right up on the iPad in the app Keynote. Um, so just completely flawless interface and you go right into books like this one that are just so easy to uh, to edit. And anyone who's got a newer iDevice, like uh, an iPad 3, iPad 4, um, Keynote's a free app on it. It just comes standard. So, um, Mag, when, here's one of Maggie's alphabet books. Um, so we're teaching her alphabet names and sounds um, in relation to the people who matter most to her. And I mean, this is a really important way to also enhance her communication. So if she's acting sad or lonely, well, where's your people book? Who are you thinking about? Is there someone you want to invite over? If she's looking at someone's page on the book, we can say, hey, let's give them a call, right? Um, so here's all the, the people in her life that matter the most are in her alphabet book. And like I said, the people in her life that matter the most are in her alphabet book. So there's Harry Styles from One Direction. If you don't know what One Direction is, you don't have a 10 to 12 year old world. Um, the app Kid in Story Creator is brilliant. It's like a $6 app. I'm hoping everybody out there has iPads because I know I'm showing you a lot of apps. Um, but what it does is it allows us to add our child to basically any background. We can add characters, celebrities, anything to just about any background. I'll give you some examples. So this is what the app looks like. Um, what we have here is the picture of the car is just an image off the web. And Niall, who's a member of the band One Direction, is also just a cutout of a picture off the web. Literally, I just went online, saved those pictures in my browser, and um, cut and pasted them together. So using this app, we can do things like, my child really likes Harry Styles, or at least did last summer. Harry Styles can go with her to Girl's Ride Camp. Um, studying the American Civil Rights Movement at school, look, we can put Harry Styles right in the audience. Um, if Noah really likes cars, maybe he's learning words, uh, preposition words like in, out, on, we can put him right in the car. If he's got a favorite car, right, this is a great story prompt. Um, here's another great story prompt, right? I mean, what guy wouldn't want to read a book about him with a hot girl? Uh, if you've got a kid who really likes Elmo, right, you can see how easy it is. We just, um, it allows us to very, very easily just basically cut and paste um, and add elements that can make any book much more personal, much more engaging um, to our kids. And it allows us to edit in a way that every time you've imported a kid's image, it's just saved down here in your memory bar, so you can go back and see any picture you've ever done, any picture that's in your camera roll, any picture you find on the web, you can turn into a book. Highly, highly engaging. Um, the app also, um, I go back, you can see this little red record button. Um, you can save it as an electronic book um, with digital, with recorded voice. You can just uh, record um, you reading each page. And it's great if you've got one of those kids like mine who's an amazing um, iPad hacker and can go in and edit anything you make. There's actually a Kid in Story reader app, which all it does is let you read it. You can't edit. So the Kid in Story creator app lets you make books, Kid in Story Reader lets you read them. As long as you save all of your books in Kid in Story Reader, then even if your child does edit all over all of the books you so carefully made them, uh, you have a backup in the Kid in Story Reader. All right, let's talk about writing. So um, with our students with Angelman, what we heard from families is that about a third of our kids do not write or draw. Um, and I would assume for the most part that that has to do with how so many of our kids have such um, tactile sensitivity. They're just, their hands are so sensitive. And I think their hands are such an important part of how they get information about the world. They're so often touching things that it's actually really difficult for them to organize their hands to hold things like crayons and marking tools. 
to write with. So if you've got a child who won't grasp tools, um, that's a sensory issue. That's a sensory integration issue. That's tactile defensiveness. Um, and it's crucial for those kids that we don't do things like hand over hand to force them to, um, to hold tools. Um, but about 60% you know, of our kids are really exploring tools and writing tools. They might be chewing on them, they might be marking, they might be touching them. About the same proportion are making some marks with writing and drawing tools. Their marks might appear random, but they're, they're doing something with it. Only about 20% of our kids appear to be writing or drawing with a purpose, um, such as continuous lines, things that actually look like letters. Um, only a small minority are, are writing in a way, when they're writing with a pencil, that it looks recognizable. And that all comes back to the fine motor control issues that come with Angelman syndrome, which then leads us to the need for what's called alternative pencils. An alternative pencil is anything that allows a student to access the alphabet without having to hold a pencil to form every single letter, right? Because if you've got a pencil and you know the alphabet, you have access to the whole alphabet. You can write anything. You can scribble anything. Um, if you don't have, if you can't have that, uh, if you don't have that, if you don't have the fine motor control to hold a pen or pencil, then you need another way to get access to the letters of the alphabet. Having access to the letters of the alphabet is the single most important thing for kids to begin writing and to really understand what writing is. Here's some examples. One of these examples is not from a student with any money. Four of them are. This is what early writing looks like. Our kids' early writing, um, for our kids who are picking up pencils and making marks, is pretty indistinguishable from typical kids who are probably much younger, but what typical kids do. This is how kids learn how to write. Our kids need access um, to learning how to scribble and draw. They need things that they can write with. Um, so in terms of traditional pencils, um, if our kids won't hold coloring pencils or crayons, that kind of stuff, um, things like dry erase um, crayons are really, really vivid colors, oil pastels, they're really soft, really vivid. Our kids don't have to really firmly grasp something to be able to get a mark on a page. Um, they can get kind of a nice high impact result from having tried to draw um, with very little um, effort or really with a uh, without a lot of grasping, which is just a big issue for so many of our kids. But either way, this is what early writing looks like, and our kids are trying to do it when they have access to drawing and writing tools, um, when they don't have so much tactile sensitivity. Um, so again, here are two examples of what early writing looks like from students with Angelman, and one example from a typically developing kid. It kind of looks the same. Um, this is what scribbling looks like. This is how kids explore the alphabet. So typical kids fill up the page with as many letters as they can. They want to feel like writers. When a child sends a text message of that many letters or fills up a page, as you can see on the left here, that example I'm up, when they fill the page with that many letters, what that is telling you is that they know that they're writers. They know that they can access letters. They don't know what words look like yet. They don't know how to spell most words. They're still learning all of that stuff, but they're learning that they are writers, which means that they're learning they can share a story using the alphabet. That's a huge, huge part of what leads to engagement around writing. So making sure our kids have access to the alphabet is essential. The most common way that people get access to the alphabet, the most common alternative pencil is a keyboard. So when we asked our families, how many of your kids use a keyboard, more than half do not use a keyboard at all. And I don't know from that question whether that means that our kids are not being given the opportunity to type on keyboard. Maybe they come over and they bang away on the keyboard so much and so they kind of put the keyboard away, or for whatever reason they're not reaching out and touching it. Um, Half of our kids, when given a keyboard, type random characters, letters, numbers, characters. So they have not yet learned that numbers are different from letters, which are different from punctuation marks. Um, about 22% of our kids type long strings of letters. It appears very random to us. And only a very small minority type short strings of words that are actually grouped like words. So. Um, and I'll show you an example in a minute. Um, so words that, which is, which is just really, really interesting, that 
what kids do when they have access to the alphabet tells us so much about what they understand about words. So we want to be giving kids the opportunity to have access to the alphabet as much as possible. It's an amazingly important assessment tool um, as much as it is a tool for them to be able to explore. Maggie has had uh, two years of writing instruction and has progressed from, and really her writing instruction means that once a day, um, we try to have it be once a day, it doesn't always happen, um, she is given the opportunity to write in a more structured way about a topic of her choosing. In the beginning, she was a kid who did not type on keyboards at all, she didn't know what it meant. Um, for a year or so, it was very random characters. Um, then she started typing long strings of letters, where it's clear that she's now learned what's a letter versus what's a number. Um, then her, her typing uh, went from kind of long strings, like what you saw back here, that example in the middle is Maggie's typing, um, to very word-like groupings, and now she's typed some recognizable words. She is deletion positive. She is pretty representative in many ways of our kids. Um, it's the opportunity. It's the daily opportunity. It's making sure that we're taking the time to give her access to the alphabet, opportunity to type, um, and making sure that she has examples of other people typing the same way, conveying meaning the same way, that's developing her writing skills. Um, so we asked families, um, over 400 families told us how often does their person write with the letters of the alphabet in any way. And here's what really showed us it's about opportunity. About 35, about 8% of our kids have regular opportunity throughout the day to type. So Maggie would sit her down intentionally, um, try to do once a day, to sit her down intentionally to write. Um, but she has access to the key, to a keyboard all the time. She, if you're Facebook friends with her, you'll see what I mean. Um, she often comments and messages people with iMessage on Facebook. She sends emails. She posts things. Um, so we just try to make sure that she has lots of access and to the alphabet, and that's kind of the way that she's chosen. If you look at this, what we see, though, is that two-thirds of our kids currently have no access to the alphabet to learn how to write, which means that they're not gaining that experience of how you work with the alphabet, um, how letters can be put together to kind of mean one thing one way and then mean something else completely different, um, how everyone else realizes you are a writer when you put letters together. So it's just crucial to give our kids the opportunity to um, Two-thirds of our kids do not make any mark or scribble to represent their name, and a small minority will um, stamp their name without a prompt, that kind of thing. Writing your name um, is probably the most important. Um, if a child can do one thing with a pencil, if an adult can do one thing with a pencil or a pen, being able to make a mark that represents their name is probably it. Um, but we know that for so many of our kids, they're being encouraged to stamp and not even try to develop signature. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and 44%, so about 40, uh, less than half of our kids are exploring and playing with alphabet materials and toys. About 20% of our kids know that letters are different from pictures and other kinds of shapes. About a third of our kids recognize the first letter in their name or other letters in their name. They're beginning to recognize letters in other people's names. They can identify some letters, but 40% of our kids are not playing with or engaging with letters of the alphabet. Those are the kids I'm the most concerned about. We've got to get them doing it. We have to, and somewhere in there is another 20%, because if we've got 44% who are exploring the alphabet, 40% are not. We might have a few more in there who we have to figure out a way to get them using the alphabet in meaningful ways. Um, let's see. I'm going to skip this one, except to say, um, you'll notice down at the bottom that 14% of our kids, the families report the child has awareness that different words begin with the same sound. So A is for apple, A is for asparagus. 12% um, can identify some initial letter sounds or make some letter sound matches. All the literacy work we, we do with our kids, if all it leads to is being able to identify some initial letter sounds. That could be life-changing for so many of our kids. Imagine if our child has a sign for thirsty, 
and then can give you the letter T. You probably know them well enough to know what drink they're thirsty for that starts with the letter T, right? Um, something that they're hungry for, a book they want to read, a person they want to see, if they can do and if they can get to the point of initial letter sounds, if that's all they do, it can make their communication so much more specific by giving them access to things that might not otherwise even be in their communication system. It can give them, because the alphabet is around us everywhere. There's always a QWERTY keyboard around us somewhere. So even if their communication system is down, or if they don't have a communication system yet, whatever the issue is, um, if they can get to that point, um, it can make them so much more specific and powerful in their communication. All right. Um, and I'm going to skip that one and skip that because I'm running out of time. Okay. So here is a really, really easy thing that all of us can do at home. This is an alphabet book made from one of those templates I showed you before. You can do it on your computer. You can do it on blank paper with cutout pictures. You can do it on your iPad. Um, this was made in the app Keynote. C is for carrots. C is for carrot. So you can see that for some kids that might be carrot, for other kids that might be. Go ahead and use their picture. What's really nice about alphabet books is see that we are drawing very specific attention to the letters of the alphabet. C is for carrot, right? You're going to get lots of repeated exposure to the most important letters and to the kinds of sounds the letters make. The other thing we can do is that in their communication system, they probably have a symbol for things like carrot. They probably have a symbol for things like bananas. That's good, right? Because in their communication system, they're using, learning to use a symbolic way of communicating um, to get their message across. If we're going to use pictures, then let's use pictures and things like alphabet. We want to be teaching them the symbols in their communication system, but their alphabet books can be where it's the picture of what they actually know. So for one kid, that might be cheese to them. To another kid, that might be what cheese looks like. And to another kid, to my kid, who's on the ketogenic diet, very high fat, all she eats is triple cream brie, that's what cheese looks like to her. So in her alphabet book for food, I can have exactly what her food item looks like. Um, for one kid, that might be mac and cheese, and for another kid, that might be mac and cheese. The alphabet book is just a way to write them a book, just like the one we saw earlier about I like food, um, of all their favorite foods. But what we can then do is use it on a regular basis. So I'm making a grocery list. I'm going to have my alphabet book in front of me. I'll be talking to my child. Um, show me something you want to make sure I get at the grocery store. And if she shows me the cheese page, I'm going to write cheese down. I'm going to look at her alphabet book and say, cheese, C is for cheese. I need to write a C. What's the next letter I need to write down? She's going to see have that kind of letter-by-letter letter attention to the foods that tend to motivate so many of our kids, right? So if it's their communication system that we're using to brainstorm the grocery list, then you can see the same thing. We've got their symbol and we've got the word above it. But let's be using it. So we make things like these alphabet books, and then we really use them. What is it you want for dinner tonight? What is it we need to pick up at the grocery store? Maybe right now, saying what are we going to pick up at the grocery store is too abstract for our child. So we might bring their alphabet book of all their favorite foods to the grocery store. We might reference, we might have their alphabet book open while we're eating. Oh, we're eating peas. You like the peas. Let's look it up. Peas for peas, right? Um, C is for cheese. So we can be using it. And what we're doing is really showing how tangibly meaningful um, the alphabet is um, at the same time that we are learning about um, drawing connections between um, the things that they care the most about um, and getting access to them, right? Because once they make the connection that letters are what get you your favorite foods at the grocery store, now the act of writing is not nearly so abstract, right? Um, and there's a whole bunch of ways that we can help our kids access the alphabet um, for all kinds of different writing activities. So these are just little printouts. You just print them out on your computer. You can print them out at Staples, whatever you need to do. Just making sure that they're always surrounded by the alphabet. Um, I'll show you some more examples. So here's our little guy, Josh, and kind of one of his breakthrough activities I just thought was brilliant was he was playing with this leapfrog letter toy, and his family just started with each letter that he selected. His family just started going, you know, 
O. What could O be for? O is for oranges. What else do we have here in the kitchen that matches that? And he was able to draw those connections between all of the things that were so familiar to him and the letters on the alphabet just by his family responding every time he touched a letter. It could have been about people. It could have been about foods. It could have been about toys. It could have been about activities. It could be about a whole bunch of things. But these are all really simple, commonly available toys that can help our kids access the alphabet. And now let's say you've got one of these really common toys um, and you're asking your child, what is it you want for dessert tonight that you can have? Cookie, for, I'm going to put a C, you can have ice cream, let's look in your book, that starts with an I, or you could have yogurt, that starts, let's look in your book, starts with a Y. So here's your choices, and down in this toy below we're going to put a C, an I, and a Y. Which one would you like? We're voting by letters so that our children are learning that letters matter. Letters are really meaningful in my day-to-day -day life. We can do voting by letters with magnetic letters um, on a cookie sheet. We can do uh, voting by letters in S on the keyboard such as Word Wizard. Word Wizard is voting, by the way. Um, it can sound out words. It can do all kinds of great things. So, but you see what we're trying to do here is bring the alphabet into everyday life in a way that our kids become more powerful and more specific when they use it. Um, we can be using, we can be doing the same thing with whiteboards, just having dry erase crayons and I can write my C is for cookies and my Y is for yogurt on the whiteboard and ask my child to choose between them with that. I can then use our communication system to clarify and make sure that that was the right choice, right? That, or I can just bring it to them and I can show them the letters in their communication system. But what matters is that I'm making the alphabet so, so tangible. Um, there's lots of other writing kinds of things we can do. This is just an example of um, the most common um, two words that we put together when we're writing things like I like, I am. So it's so easy to make books for our kids, especially over the summer, in this, um, about the different kinds of things they're going to do or the things I can't. So right now for us it's just the start of summer. In summer I can. It goes through your communication system. What can we do? Let's write sentences about what we can do this summer. Um, we can go on a picnic. I'm going to write that down. P is for picnic. At a picnic, I like to do what, right? It might be one day I, we write sentences about in summer I can, and the next day we write sentences about at a picnic what I like to do. The next day we write, a sen we write sentences about a can trip, right? These aren't things we're all going to do all at once, and it's not something all of us are going to do, but just be thinking about the ways that we can engage with our children using their pictures, their communication system, their alphabet books to do these kinds of writing activities. Here's some other just fun writing prompts. Literally, if you just Google writing prompts, you'll get a billion. Um, this is one of those um, PowerPoint um, downloads. So literally, all I did was is download um, a template um, right into my keynote and just start filling it in. This is what it would look like if you just opened it up. I like, I like what? We're going to glue in a picture, we're going to finish the sentence, and that's our writing activity for the day. I am, I am what? I went, I went where? Right? Um, on any one day, all we might be trying to do is finish a single sentence. Um, we know that most of our kids are not currently using symbols or print to communicate. In fact, very few of them really are. But you can see how if we can get them engaged in these kind of activities, it fosters communication as much as it does, um, as much as it does their, their literacy skills. And what we're really teaching them is that they have a story to tell and that we want to hear it. Um, this is just a really important example. So this is Emma. This is the kind of drawing that she does all day long. It is clear from looking at this that she is telling us a story. She is using letters and figures to represent something and we don't know what it means. So my goal for her would be that she learns to use her communication system to help us understand what it is she's writing about. Our kids have stories inside we need to help them share. Um, it might be that their most meaningful writing for them will be things like Facebook. Um, iMessaging, right? What happens when they get an iPhone? It might be that we're going to start with really simple prompts. Um, we're going to use their alphabet book of all their favorite people to choose someone we're going to write a note to. We're going to write the first part of the sentence for them. I love you more than what? See if they can fill in the blank. I love you because why? 
How can they fill in the blank? What can we, what kind of interaction can we have with our kids to figure out how they might um, be able to finish these sentences? Then we ask them to make some mark on the page and we go deliver the card, right? That's all we're trying to do is just show how tangible, how important these kind of literacy activities are. Anytime, it's really about extending an invitation. And anytime we're inviting to anything, encourage your kids to sign their invitations themselves. They don't need to stamp for that, right? Everybody will know that their mark is their own. Um, have them be signing thank you cards, drawing any kind of picture, their own, whatever they can draw um, is good enough. And you can show them after the fact, wow, that's how you wrote chance. Here's how I write chance. But that's just so cool that you're writing your name, right? Our kids first have to believe that they're writers before they can develop the skills. Of writing and these are the things that typical kids do to be able to do that. Our kids can send us in birthday cards. We all have that one friend who never forgets our birthday. Well our kids can be that one friend who never forgets a birthday. We can get all of their birthday, all of the important people in their world, we can get them downloaded right into the calendar app on their iPad, into a calendar on the wall, and we can support them to send um, a birthday card every month, right? That's a, or every year or two each of those people. That's a really tangible way to increase their social connections with all the people that matter in their lives, to show them a, a meaningful use um, for writing, and it's just get them writing. Uh, there's lots of really, really great apps for sending them, but what matters is we're really teaching them to tell their story. And now I'm going to skip through a bit, because once again, I'm so behind schedule. Um, but again, what it comes down to is emergent literacy behaviors develop by having access to opportunities and experiences. And so we just have to be thinking of new ways to help our kids access more experiences, access more opportunity for more of these kinds of natural reasons why we read and write at home. Um, I would encourage you, if, um, if you want to keep exploring this, to join our Angel Mind Literacy and Education group on Facebook. Um, that's the kind of place where people go and say, okay, I watched the webinar, I'm trying to make an alphabet book, but here's my problem, and a whole bunch of moms will chime in and give you suggestions. Um, the website that I just can't say enough about is the Center for Literacy and Disability Studies. This is where I found those PowerPoint book templates that just make it so much easier to write those really easy, um, those simple books like the alphabet books. Um, so here's the web address above, and you can see there's one of those big blue arrows is pointing to PowerPoint book templates. Interestingly, the resources I find that apply the most to our kids with Angelman syndrome are the ones that Gretchen Hanser developed for students who are deafblind. Meaning not that those students were all like Helen Keller where they couldn't see and couldn't hear anything, but they had impairment, probably neurological impairment, that affected their ability both to see and to hear. That's what deafblind means. And so many of our kids have many of those symptoms of not being able to integrate their vision and their hearing easily together. Um, and therefore, the things on the deafblind model classroom resources just apply beautifully. And there we go. Any questions? <laughs> Thanks, Erin. Um, actually, there are a couple of questions for you. Um, one of them, and I don't know if you just mentioned it there at the end, but what was the name of the visual impairment you mentioned that causes the need for visual adaptation? Cortical visual impairment. It's called CVI. So an optometrist or an ophthalmologist might assess our kids how their eye works as an organ in their body. Is, it, is the eye doing the things it's supposed to do? But really only a funct functional visual assessment tells us how do our kids use their vision? Are they able to use their vision? What strategies are they using? And there's often a huge disconnect between what their eye can see mechanically and what their brain can see based on the information it can receive from its eye, if that makes sense. So it's called CVI, and I think it's very common in our kids. It just hasn't been studied. Okay. Another question is, um, just out of curiosity, how old was Maggie when you started giving her daily opportunities to write? Uh, I think she would have been eight. Okay. And then I the last, nine. Nine. Okay, the last question that we have, unless anybody sends any over right now, um, we have... Um, <laughs> It's when you say that most kids with AS are emergent readers, do you mean that's where they stay? 
No, we don't know where they'll stay because, frankly, we have so few kids and adults with Angelman syndrome who have received effective literacy instruction, right? There has been enormous research about what kids need in terms of instruction, what they need in terms of experiences and opportunities in order to learn how to read and write. And when you then say, okay, how many students with significant disabilities have had access to that instruction? A tiny, tiny percent. So we don't know. One thing we do know, though, is we cannot make predictions about which students will become traditional, conventional readers and writers and which ones won't. There is no way of looking at any one kid and knowing. All we can do, and huge researchers in the field, Diane Browder, Karen Erickson, um, major, major researchers in the field have all come to this conclusion. What we can do is provide the most effective instruction to all kids. We can expect that all kids will make some progress, and we should expect that some kids will actually become conventional readers and writers. But in the meantime, as long as we take that approach that we're not feeding them spinach, as long as we're not like locking them in a room and showing them flashcards and, and having this kind of literacy instruction that's so disconnected, as long as it's we're creating, as long as we're focusing on those emergent opportunities that get kids naturally enticed to be part of reading and writing, then all we're doing is developing their communication skills while we're doing it, right? We will do no damage if we really focus on um, kind of those emergent literacy opportunities. The most it's going to do is make them more expressive. The least it's going to do, sorry, the least it will do is help our kids express more. Okay, we actually had a couple more come in. Um, one is, my child is more tuned to videos, how to incorporate reading using videos. Beautiful. Um, so Meg is exactly the same way, um, and I worship the app um, Explain Everything. If you join that Angelman um, Literacy and Education group and ask about this, um, I'll chime in there, a whole bunch of other people will, but there is an app in the iTunes App Store, um, $2.99 called Explain Everything, and it lets you take any still image and record over it. So you saw two of the videos um, that had been made in Explain Everything. I should have had a slide of just the app um, where that red laser pointer um, is, is reading over them. That's the app we use to turn things into video, and we do we use that app for Maggie's sight word instruction. We use it for her phonics instruction. We use it for everything. We also make extensive use of video modeling. So that might mean having a classmate go through a phonics lesson. Um, we use something called systematic sequential phonics, um, where we're recording it, or where a student is doing a phonics lesson on her on the iPad, and we're actually taking a screen recording so that Maggie can watch it after the fact. So video modeling and the app explain everything. Okay. Um, and then last question. Um, well, first the comments. They said wonderful presentation. Uh, what roles would you like to see SSLPs play in the literacy, literacy development of kids with AS? Oh, that's so good. <laughs> I missed the very last part of that, but I think I got the gist of the question. Um, I think, so there's a few things. I think that speech therapists are uniquely positioned to raise expectations. Um, probably the most common thing we see is that what the child really needs, and this is, you know, the research from Pat Miranda, Buchelman, all these folks, is that aided language input, that they need to have models of people using their communication system so that they can learn from it. And if the speech therapist is on board with that and is the leader of the team, helping them under, helping the rest of the team understand why modeling that communication system is so essential. I think that's the number one most life-changing thing that a speech therapist can do. But I think, unfortunately, so many of our speech language pathologists, they have a huge caseload and they don't have enough kids with the kind of complex communication needs we see in Angelman to really be aware of that. And so, you know, they instead get the the team focus on, you know, things like PECs, which can help kids learn how to, to request, but not really help them communicate. Um, so I think that's number one, is raising expectations and teaching them about aided language input, and then helping to think about um, how can the child communicate during literacy activities, right? So that when I'm sitting my child down and we're going to read Dr. Seuss, how can Maggie tell me 
boring, I like that, um, play it out loud, or act it out, or read it in a silly voice, or something else, or again, 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 right? Um, so that speech therapists really get teens thinking about what is the language the child needs access to during literacy opportunities, during these literacy experiences, so that they can have access to a more similar experience as a speaking peer. All right, perfect. That's all the questions that we had. There's a lot of comments that are just thanking you for all the wonderful resources. And like I said, we are recording the session. You guys can watch it again later if you would like. Um, we'll have it up probably either later today or tomorrow. And we'll also have Aaron's slides up as well. So if you need any of those resources, you can get that from there. Uh, Aaron, thank you again for your third one in a row with us. We appreciate you taking the time to do these. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.